This sermon was preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on January the 8th, 2023. It is entitled, Looking to the Pioneer and Perfecter of Our Faith, based on our 2023 motto verse of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1b and, chap and verse 2. For our two scripture readings, I will first read Hebrews 11, 17 to 40, followed by Hebrews 12, 1 to 17. We'll begin with Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 40. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to, that, to their future. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover as the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And then continuing into chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of Spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, 
Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We read those powerful words in Hebrews 11, verse 6. If pleasing God is important, and it is because our joy in this life and our destiny in the next depend upon it, then a proper understanding of faith is also necessary. What is faith? Broadly speaking, faith means trusting in something or someone. When I sit down, I have faith that the chair will not collapse under me. While that is true, the scripture also gives a far more narrow definition of faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith, in a biblical sense, means believing in God. It means taking him at his word and expecting that he will fulfill all of his promises which are given to us in Jesus. For example, the Apostle Paul writes, Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And we think of Abraham's life and the promises that God made to him, the promise that as an old man, he would have a son. A child from his own body would be his inheritor of all of the promises of God. And Abraham thought, God, you're powerful enough to bring it to pass. I believe in you. I trust in you. He had faith in God. He had a strong faith. And the object of his faith, the one in whom he trusted, is God Almighty. And the question is, what about us? Where do we look for, for meaning, purpose, and joy in this life, and hope for the life to come? To whom do we look for salvation, for forgiveness? By faith, we are to look to Jesus. Our eyes are to be fixed upon him. The only true and solid resting place for our faith is Jesus in whom all of the promises of God are fulfilled. This morning we are going to once again turn to our motto verse, Hebrew 12, 1b and 2, which reads, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Last week, we did a broad survey on the key phrase, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. As we run the Christian race, it is essential that we look to Jesus. We are to keep our gaze upon him because he is our savior, our example, our Lord, and our prize. Today, we are going to reflect on what it means that Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. We will look at these two words, pioneer and perfecter, in turn, and then as a third point, we will add a related word, pattern. Jesus is the pioneer, the perfecter, and the pattern of our faith. The pioneer of our faith. Different translations of the scripture use various words in this verse. The words chosen by those who translated the NIV are pioneer and perfecter. And when I hear the word pioneer, 
I think of men and women of families who moved west across North America seeking to settle down in an unfamiliar and difficult area looking for land and opportunity. They lived on what is called the frontier. They were the first Europeans to live in these new places. Well, Jesus is called the pioneer of our faith. He is the one who goes before us. This word is translated in other versions and paraphrases as author, founder, originator, source, the first incentive of our belief, and the champion who initiates our faith. In speaking about this faith, one author notes, we are keenly conscious, conscious, conscious of the faith that is needed to accomplish these things, the faith that is needed to run the race well. Nonetheless, the author of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. The word author means that Jesus is the originator or founder of our faith. In other words, our faith is a gift from God. Jesus makes our faith happen. Our faith comes from him. He is the champion who initiates our faith. Our faith journey begins because of Jesus. Without Jesus, we could not have a faith journey, and that is because he is the object of our faith. He is the one to whom our faith looks. Faith needs an object. Faith must believe in something or someone. You know, in our day and age, sometimes the word faith is just sort of used as a standalone, but that doesn't make any sense. Faith must have an object. And all too often, Faith is misplaced. We trust in the wrong things. And one of the most common objects of misplaced faith is ourselves. In the evenings, I, more often than I would like to admit, fall asleep in front of the TV. And one time this week, I woke up to hear Shania Twain being interviewed on a late night talk show. She was promoting her latest album entitled Queen of Me. And she explained that she wrote the songs on the album during the difficult days of COVID to encourage herself. She said, no one else can cheer me up. That is my responsibility. Where does she look for when she needs hope and strength? She looks to herself, the one who is queen of me. Similarly, I heard someone else on another program say that They inspire themselves. Where do I look to for motivation and inspiration? I look to me. We hear similar ideas of trusting in ourselves all over the place in the public sphere. However, the biblical teaching is very different. The scripture declares that we cannot look to ourselves. We are not designed to be objects of our faith, to provide our own hope and strength to inspire ourselves, to cheer ourselves up. We cannot provide the salvation that we need. We cannot, in and of ourselves, make ourselves right with God. We are to look to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who is worthy of our faith. He is the Almighty One, the Alpha and the Omega. He doesn't get confused or overwhelmed or frustrated. He is not subject to human weakness or or change or decay. He is the King of Kings. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we look to ourselves, or if we look to other people, or to financial success, to money, or to entertainment, we're not going to find rest for our souls. Jesus says, turn to me. Look to me with eyes of faith, and you'll find rest. And Jesus encouraged people to believe in him, knowing that he is the true and sure anchor for our souls. 
He is the one who gives us rest in this difficult world. Our strength for this life and our hope for the next is found in Jesus Christ, the one who is our Savior, example, Lord, and prize. To run the Christian race, our eyes are to be fixed upon Jesus. He is the object of our faith. And so when we think of this idea of Jesus being the pioneer of our faith, where does our faith begin? Our faith begins by looking to Jesus. But not only does Jesus make our faith happen by being the object of our faith, the one to whom we are to look, he also enables us to look. He is the pioneer and author of our faith because he gives us the gift of faith. Faith comes to us from God through Jesus. Have you ever missed out on something because you were looking the wrong way? Maybe you're watching a game and something or someone distracted you and you turned away and you missed a goal or a spectacular play. Jesus knows that we need to be spiritually enlightened in order to look to him. Left to ourselves, we won't look to Jesus. We need him to do a work in our heart. By nature, Humans love darkness, and we will not look to the one who is the light. Because we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we will not gaze upon the Savior and recognize his beauty. But Jesus is the author of our salvation. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit into the world and into our hearts to convict us of our sin and to give us eyes to see and hearts to understand. He enables us to look to him for salvation. He opens our eyes so that we might see that he is the Savior that we need. Jesus is the pioneer of our faith. He is the object of our faith, the one to whom we are to look, and then he enables us to look to him for life and salvation and forgiveness. The pioneer of our faith. And secondly, Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. A perfecter is one who makes something perfect or complete. As a result, this word is also translated in other versions and paraphrases as finisher, goal, the champion who perfects our faith, and the one who brings our faith to maturity. And that is what Jesus does. He brings our faith to its intended goal. As one writer says, not only does our faith come from him, but he also sustains our faith. He is also the perfecter or the one who completes our faith. The word pioneer makes us think about beginnings. Jesus is the one who initiates our faith, while the word perfected makes us think about completion. Jesus is the one who finishes our faith, who brings it to its end. And in selecting these words, The writer of this letter is communicating that our faith is all about Jesus. From beginning to end, it is about Jesus. For every day in this life and into eternity, our hope is Jesus. Wherever you're at in the Christian journey, or even if you haven't even started the Christian journey, what are we to do? We're to look to Jesus. Our faith is to be in him. Jesus sustains us in our faith throughout our lives. He enables us to endure all of the hardships and difficulties that we may face. Were you struck with what some of the men and women of past have gone through when Al read through that section in Hebrews 11? How they went around deprived. How they didn't have homes. And how some were persecuted. And all that they endured. What enabled them to go through All of these hardships, they trusted in God and in his promises. They had well-placed faith. We need him every day and every hour. As I quoted last week, Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches. We must remain joined to him in order to grow and be fruitful. One of the churches that gave the Apostle Paul grief was the church in Galatia. And in chapter 3, he writes, 
I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So what he's saying is, you began your Christian life. The church was founded by faith in Jesus. And by this faith, you received the Holy Spirit. And you were running well. Things were operating as they should be. But now, for some reason, you're not living by faith anymore. You're trusting in your actions, by what you do. Well, is that how it's supposed to be? How's that going for you, is essentially what Paul is saying. And says, no, you can't live your life, your Christian life, trusting in your good deeds, trusting in your works. You began the Christian life by faith, and you continue the Christian life by faith. Your eyes are still to be fixed upon Jesus, and he is the one who will bring you into glory. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Keep trusting in his power and his promises. Keep depending upon the spirit that he has given to you. Jesus is the one who will sustain you through the race. And he is the one who will bring you to the end. Jesus will complete in you what he has started. Being confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If we have believed in Jesus, then the scripture makes it clear that he will be with us all of the days all of our days in this life, and he will bring us safely into the next. And listen to these three scriptures which emphasize this point. John 10, 27 to 30. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus is the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He takes care of the sheep. He will always take care of the sheep. He'll protect them, provide for them, bless them, help them. And Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. It's faith. My sheep trust in me. My sheep believe in me. And I give them eternal life. They will never perish. Jesus doesn't say, I give eternal life to some. I'll give eternal life to a few. I'll give eternal life to all of them. All those who believe in me. He is the perfecter of faith. There is assurance and confidence in Jesus. Then early on in the letter to Hebrews, this is from Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Where does assurance come from? How can we be confident that Jesus is the perfecter of our faith, that if we trust in him, if we look to him, that we will enter into his glory? We can be sure, because he died on the cross and rose again. All of our sins were atoned for on the cross. And if we are in Christ, then we are washed. We are cleansed. And he will bring us into his kingdom. Just as the author and perfecter of our faith was raised from the dead, so too will we be raised with him and live with him forever. He died the sufficient atoning death and rose again. And then 2 Timothy 1, 9 to 12. Paul writes, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, 
who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And so in these few verses, Paul first speaks about the grace of God, the work of God in his life and in the world. The Savior has appeared. And Paul says, and I'm a minister. I have been called to be a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. And because of this calling, I'm suffering. But this suffering that Paul endures, he says, it's no cause for shame. I'm not grieved by it. It doesn't bother me. Because I know whom I have believed. And I know that the one whom I have believed, he will fulfill his promises. He is trustworthy. He is full of love. He is the eternal one. He is the I am. And so every word that he has said will come to pass. And so I'm convinced that he will guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. And what is Paul entrusted to Christ? He's entrusted his life, his hope, his destiny, his future, his everything. He's entrusted to Christ. And he says, my faith in him is well placed. He will guard it. I am assured of that because Christ is who he says he is. The son of God, the perfect one, the risen one. Those who believe in Jesus can be assured of salvation because he is the finisher, the perfecter of faith. He will always be with his people. He will never leave us or forsake us. And he will bring all of God's children home to glory. Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter. And thirdly, the pattern of our faith. These words, pioneer and perfecter, have deep and rich meaning. They emphasize that Jesus is the beginning and end of our faith, that our Christian journey is all about him from beginning to end, from conversion to glory. It's all about him. But in addition, these words also draw our minds to considering that Jesus is the pattern for our faith. A.W. Pink notes that this passage teaches us about the Lord as the supreme example for racers as well as the great object of their faith. And we've already considered that Jesus is the great object of our faith. Well, now, for a moment, let's reflect on Jesus as the pattern or the supreme example of our faith. In Hebrews 11, the writer has referred to many men and women of faith. And we are to look to these individuals as those who feared God, whose eyes were fixed upon him, and his promises. But the greatest example of faith is Jesus Christ. In what way is Jesus an example of faith? And obviously, his situation is different than ours. He is divine. He has a unique relationship with the Father. But in his humanity, Jesus was called to trust in the promises of God and to live accordingly. And he did this with perfection. Jesus knew what his earthly mission would entail, the humility, the suffering, and the crucifixion. But he had also received promises from the Father, promises that he would rise again, that he would be exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high, that all those who believed in him would have eternal life. And he trusted in the Father and his word. So he was obedient to the point of death. And then God fulfilled his promise. God raised Jesus from the dead and has set him above all in glory. Jesus' faith teaches us that suffering has a purpose. Jesus suffered. He suffered physically in that his body was broken and his blood was shed. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. That is the intense 
physical pain and agony that Jesus endured. Jesus suffered emotionally. He was rejected by his people. Those he came to save and deliver despised him. His disciples forsook him. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. The words of the psalmist were fulfilled in Jesus' life and experience. The psalmist writes, If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshippers. Jesus knew the emotional pain of being hurt by his friends and loved ones. And Jesus suffered spiritually. The Father turned his face away from his beloved Son as he was hanging on the cruel cross. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered. He willingly suffered and laid down his life because he believed in the plan of the Father. He trusted that his suffering has a purpose, that it would bring about the salvation of many, and that is what happened. That is why our verse says that he scorned the shame of the cross. We suffer. We live in a world of suffering. And all too often, our hardship, our suffering, does not make sense to us. We don't understand why a, our good and loving God would allow pain and misery and death and sickness to come into our lives and the lives of our loved ones. And the scripture doesn't give us all the answers. But it does teach us that suffering is part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan for Jesus. It was part of God's plan for these men and women of faith that we read of in Hebrews 11. And like Jesus, we are to endure the suffering, trusting in the Father. Jesus' faith teaches us that the Father is trustworthy. Even when we are going through suffering, even through injustice, even through the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus' faith teaches us how to suffer. And Jesus' faith similarly teaches us not to live for the present, but to look to the future. Jesus endured the cross, our motto text tells us, because of the joy that was set before him. He knew that there was more to the cross than suffering and shame. He knew that beyond the cross, there was joy incorruptible and eternal. When we look at Jesus being the supreme example of faith, we see that faith looks beyond the present beyond our circumstances in this world, to the eternal. Faith lays hold of the future. And that is the reality of those in the Old Testament. Abraham was willing to be a pilgrim and dwell in tents because he looked forward to an eternal city built by God. When we look to Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of faith, then we will, like him, not live for the present, but in light of the future. Here are a few stanzas from the poem Only One Life Twill Soon Be Passed by C.T. Studd. And listen to his perspective on life in the present as he looks to the future. He writes, Only one life, yes, only one. Soon its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life, twill soon be past. 
Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now say to me, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's the perspective of faith. That is the Christ-like perspective that those running the race are to have. Jesus lived in the present, always mindful of the future, and therefore he was committed to faithfully serving the Father. Our lives are short. They are brief. We wake up one day and then we realize that, you know, how did I end up with a 12-year-old kid? Like I was changing his diaper like yesterday, it seemed. Life goes by so fast, and eternity is forever. And that's the perspective that Jesus had. That's the perspective that these men and women of faith had. That's why they were willing to endure all manner of suffering. That's why Paul said, you know, it doesn't bother him. He'll pour out his life in the here and now, because his eyes are fixed upon Jesus. Because he knows whom he has believed. He knows whom he has entrusted his life, his hope to. Jesus provides us with the perfect example of a life of faith. The Christian life is difficult. It takes endurance, commitment, and perseverance. We are to run with our eyes fixed upon Jesus. We run knowing that he is the all-sufficient one. He is the all-powerful one. He is our Savior, our example, our Lord, and our prize. We run looking to Jesus. He is the pioneer and perfecter, the originator and completer of our faith. It is by him that we entered into the race, and it is by him that we will finish, for he will keep us and never forsake us. What hope we have in Jesus. Are you in the race? Have you looked to Jesus for salvation? As we read earlier, Jesus says, come to me. He invites everyone to come to him, to find forgiveness and eternal life in him. So, are you in the race? And even though the Bible presents the Christian life as being difficult, it's worth it. Jesus is such a sufficient and glorious prize. And then, believer, are you running your race with your eyes fixed on Jesus? Is he the center of your life? Is he the center of your life not just for an hour on Sunday, but every moment of every day? Keep your eyes upon him. Do not take your gaze off of Jesus. Trust in him, and he will not disappoint you. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for who Jesus is, that we began the Christian race by him, and that we will finish it and be entered into glory because of him. And our Father, help us to remember these truths. And even when life is difficult and challenging, maybe especially when life is difficult and challenging, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and all that that means. Help us to look to him now and every day. And thank you for the assurances that we have in him. In Jesus' name we pray.